This video is brought to you by AMD. This is the Uniblade, a floating wind turbine from Dutch startup Touchwind. And when I saw it, I knew I had to make a video on it. Floating wind turbines are a hot area of R&D, but one blade? Why? Touchwind calls their one-piece angled rotor an engineer's dream, and they say their floating, tilting turbine can produce energy much cheaper than their three-bladed cousins. But will it work? Is this unique design bonkers or pioneering? I've spent the last few weeks speaking to experts and the guys over at Touchwind to learn all about it. Touchwind describes founder and inventor Rickus van der Klipper as an aerodynamics, engineering and philosophy graduate. He's had a lifelong fascination with wind turbines and was so passionate about his revolutionary one blade design that when he initially ran out of money for prototyping, he used a stack of terrible pencil drawings, a graphical calculator that had seen better days, a cork stopper, a CD and a bundle of bamboo sticks to get support. With patents in place, Touchwind was founded in 2018. So it's early days, but with a field test in progress and investment from one of the biggest shipping companies in the world, the unique idea is gaining traction. So how will this idea aimed to solve at some of Offshore Wind's biggest challenges actually work? Touchwind's flagship system is called Mono, a floating, tilting wind turbine with a one-piece rotor. The idea is that the single angled rotor fixed to a barrel floated mast will actively orientate itself with the wind. Then when wind speeds pick up, the mast lifts itself to an upright position like a helicopter to reduce its resistance, similar to a turbine pitching its blades. But why floating? Well, because this allows it to be far offshore where the winds are steady and strong. According to Touchwind, the mono will keep working in wind speeds of up to 70 meters per second. By comparison, this three-bladed equivalent cuts out at speeds over 32 meters per second. Conventional wind turbines are also very expensive to make and install offshore. To make up for this, bigger turbines with higher power ratings have been developed at speed. Some argue this has left trailing financial and safety risks in their wake. Another challenge for floating wind turbines is survivability, because average wind speeds can be 70% higher offshore, and there's also a lot more storms. Touchwind believes the answer lies in a downwind tilting turbine. In normal wind conditions, the turbine rotates with the mast near its lowest position. As the wind speed picks up, the mast begins to move upwards as the rotor produces lift, similar to an auto gyro which if you haven't seen are these incredible machines that fly without powering the overhead propeller. Flight is instead achieved using the upwards flow of air that spins the blades and generates lift. The lifting of the mono turbine protects the rotor from spinning too fast by shifting it to an almost horizontal position. The tilt control therefore changes the turbine's axis from horizontal to vertical in high wind speeds and back to horizontal in normal wind speeds. Touchwind simulations show that a 200 meter diameter rotor could generate 12.5 megawatts of power, enough to power thousands of homes, apparently at a lower cost than a three bladed version. But the Touchwind turbine has another trick up its sleeves. This is partially why Touchwind has had an investment from one of the biggest shipping companies in the world, Mitsu OSK Lines. So what is the secret weapon? Well, as we try and develop wind farms that are denser and denser to get more power, there becomes a problem, the wake effect. Turbines can't be placed too close to each other because one turbine reduces the energy and increases turbulence in the air behind it. This is known as the wake of the turbine. With Mono's tilted blades, however, they can apparently deflect the wake downwards. So a farm of monos could be packed tighter together and capture more energy. What's more, Touchwind believes that because the mono deflects air downwards, it could pull in faster wind from the upper air layers. To evaluate this, they've used small models and simulations, using discs instead of blades to make the simulations quicker. So will this theory really stack up in reality? I spoke to an expert to help me get a better idea. However, as you probably know, innovation is an iterative process, full of trial and error. 
So before hearing from the expert, I have to tell you about today's sponsor, AMD. AMD can make the engineering and design process much easier and save you a lot of time. Simulating what-if scenarios and rendering visualizations can take precious time, and unless you've got the right machine for the job, it can unnecessarily slow you down. So if you value time and cost during the development and creative process, particularly in sectors like media, design and manufacturing, and architecture, you'll want to look at AMD's Threadripper 7000 WX series processors, which work with many types of rendering engines and can save inventors up to 27 minutes for every hour of productivity. That's because it's got up to 96 high density cores that can handle single threaded or multi-threaded tasks, and has memory large and fast enough to handle the most demanding projects in a fraction of the time, from 3D modeling and animation to complex simulations. This means computing power that can work as quickly as your ideas can flow, helping you turn them into a reality. So if you need something to accelerate not only your projects, but the possibilities of what's next, check out the AMD Threadripper 7000 WX series processors. You can follow my link, which is down in the description, or you can scan the QR code on the screen. Now, when I was speaking to the experts about the mono turbine, we discussed some interesting graphs. These indicated the mono's ability to operate in high wind speeds might be a bit of a red herring. Although oceanic wind speeds can get very high, most wind energy comes from the slower speeds. So being able to generate power at high wind speeds won't actually have much of an impact on total generation, especially if it's tilted up and not operating very efficiently, which is by design to stop the turbine spinning too fast. As for the wake effect, this is really interesting, but the big question is whether it will still work when the turbine is spinning and mixing up the airflow. This is because their simulations assume the turbines are flat disks, like frisbees. But in reality, the spinning blades might not redirect the air downwards as well as this. This is an open question and is what makes research so exciting. But you can see from their wind tunnel tests that smoke is being redirected downwards and that is definitely a good sign. Another weak point they mentioned was stability, especially with oceanic waves coming in at all directions and swells coming in at different frequencies to the waves. If the turbine is facing the wind, side waves could knock it over, because the wind and waves don't always align. Without a symmetrical base, the dynamic load could spell the beginning of the end for Mono's stability. So what did Touchwind have to say about this all? Apparently from initial tests, having the blades slightly tilted up during those common wind speeds doesn't really reduce the efficiency that much. They also told me that the real benefit of the tilting turbine is to reduce loads on the tower during storms. The fact that it's still harvesting energy at high wind speeds is more of an added bonus. As for the stability of the structure, they said they're looking at floating systems more like this one, as the barrel design is more from an older iteration. It may seem like efficiency is the most important metric, but when it comes to the real world, it all comes down to cost but more on that in a second. Touchwind also told me about a fascinating concept for 3D printing an ecological anchor. By making it easy for sea life to make homes in the structures, it promotes biodiversity underneath the wind farms. Touchwind are also working with leading research groups to simulate the wake effect that they've mentioned alongside their own real world experiments where 10 12 kilowatt turbines with 6 meter rotor diameters will be put through their paces. This testing of the wake effect is probably the most interesting part to me and has the most unanswered questions, as every good research project does. This leads us to the golden question, cost. Touchwind says that although they are still floating ideas of what the mast will be made of, it should cost half that of a conventional turbine mast. They also say that the rotor should cost a third that of a standard rotor to manufacture. But what about the levelized cost of energy for this intriguing innovation? That being the average cost of energy throughout the lifespan of the system. Exact figures haven't been released and with new ideas it's hard to gauge. But according to Touchwind's internal calculations, they expect a 30% reduction compared to other offshore wind energy projects by 2030. 
This is backed up by Marin's proof of principle test report that states six reasons behind an overall 29% cost reduction. The first four are all about simplicity of design with fewer components. This includes no active pitch control, a one-piece rotor blade, a lightweight mast, and ease of assembly, transport, and maintenance. I looked up some figures to illustrate this and was astounded to find that a semi-submersible crane vessel costs up to half a million dollars to rent per day. The final reasons behind the cost reduction claims are that it can operate at the higher wind speeds and there are increased number of turbines possible per kilometer squared thanks to that reduced wake effect. Of course, this and the real world survivability are still active research projects, but still exciting nonetheless. So what lies ahead for the Touchwind Mono? As of now, I think that the aerodynamics are interesting, but I'll be following along closely to see how the ideas of survivability and wake effect reduction play out in reality. It's early days for Mono, but given time and funding, I'm sure they'll keep iterating their design and find out some incredible things, especially with such strong collaboration from partners like Marin. Will Mono come to fruition as it is, or evolve into something quite different? Either way, it could go on to benefit offshore systems everywhere. Only time will tell. I can't wait to hear what you think about this down in the comments below and please subscribe, it's free and will keep you up to date on all of the energy engineering projects happening around the world. And if you want to accelerate your workflow, don't forget to check out AMD's Threadripper series down in the description below. Thanks for watching.